Well, welcome to Mission Hills and all of our campus. So glad you're here for the start of our last summer mini-series that we're calling Reckless. For the next three weeks, we're going to be taking kind of a deep dive into probably the most famous parable that Jesus ever taught, a parable often called the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, we've chosen not to call the series that, though, because I actually think that's a little bit of a misleading title. When we call it the parable of the prodigal son, we're, we're sort of like focused in on the idea that it's, it's a story all about this one particular son, and the reality is there's three characters in the parable, and each of them is equally important, and each of these characters is also equally reckless, which is why we've chosen to, to call the series that. They're, they're equally reckless, just in different ways and about different things. I should probably explain how I'm using that word. When I say reckless, to be reckless is to do something without caring about the cost or the consequences. It's to do something without paying attention to what it's going to cost or the consequences of that particular decision. Now, sometimes when we're reckless, it's foolish. Sometimes being reckless is, honestly, it's just stupid. It's dumb. We need to pay attention to the cost and the consequences, and if we don't, we're just idiots, okay? But sometimes being reckless isn't foolish, Sometimes being reckless isn't foolish, it just looks that way to others who don't share our priorities. When uh, we got engaged, Claude and I were seniors in college, and I, I did the right thing. I, I went to her parents and I asked if I could marry her, and, and they agreed, and so we got engaged, we're really excited about it. And uh, then, then after we were engaged, they asked the, the very natural question, which is, okay, so what are you guys going to do for a living? Right? Like how are you? And, and, and both Cled and I had sensed a call in our lives to go into vocational ministry. I say vocational because I, honestly, I believe that anytime you say yes to Jesus, from that moment on, you're a minister. You're engaged in ministry. We're, we're called to be on mission with Jesus. But some people are called to, to do that for a living, and that's what we call vocational ministry. And we both sensed that call in our lives. And so we kind of pretty excitedly told them, oh, yeah, we're going, into, we're going into vocational ministry. And there was not much rejoicing in the house at that. And there, there was crying. Because from their perspective, and they're, they're very good people, and, and they raised Coletta in a church, but, the, but their, their priority for ministry wasn't the same as ours was. And so from their perspective, that was a really foolish thing to decide. It was, it was a reckless thing, and it was a reckless, foolish thing to do. We didn't see it that way. We, we had a different set of priorities, and so we said, it doesn't matter if we're broke, which we were for most of our 25 years of our marriage. God has always provided and always been faithful, but yeah, some of their fears came true. We didn't have a lot of extra but that was okay because our priorities were different, and so it was reckless from their perspective, but it was not foolish because we had different priorities. And what we're going to see throughout this parable is that the three characters are each equally reckless, but about different things and for different reasons. Some of them foolishly so, and at least one of them not foolish at all. Why don't you go ahead and grab a Bible and make your way to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 15. The parable that we're going to be looking at actually starts in verse 11, but before we talk about the parable itself, we need to understand the context in which Jesus taught it, and so we're actually going to start in chapter 15, verse 1, where we see this. Now, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, tax collectors and sinners is sort of a blanket phrase for bad people, okay? Tax collectors were bad people because they were taking money from God's people and giving it to the Roman Empire. So really, they didn't care about God's people. They were traitors. Sinners, these would have been you know, thieves and prostitutes and, and really bad people in, in any sense of the word. Well, they didn't care about God's commandments, they didn't care about obeying what God said to do. And so this is kind of a whole group of bad people. They didn't care about God's people. They didn't care about God's commands. In other words, they were far from God, right? These are people who were far from God, but they were drawing near to Jesus, right? They're far from God, but they're drawing near to Jesus. And the religious leaders couldn't figure that out. They couldn't figure out why that was happening. And the part they really couldn't figure out was why Jesus was letting it happen, why Jesus was allowing them to draw near to him. They were concerned that he was being reckless. They thought he was being reckless with his reputation, right? They're like, Jesus, if you hang out with these people, you're going to be hurting your reputation with other people, more important people whose opinion really matters. You're being reckless with your reputation. They also thought that he was being reckless with his responsibility because as a religious teacher, his job was to confront sinners. It was to call them to change their lives and to, to move away from their sin and, and to righteousness. And they were concerned that he was being reckless with that responsibility because it's like if, if you're going to accept them before they've changed, what motivation are they going to have to change, right? Like if you accept them and welcome them and allow them to draw near to you, 
What's going to motivate them to change? And so verse 2 says, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. You're not just letting them draw near, you're eating with them. In the first century, that was a sign of acceptance. You're doing this wrong, Jesus. You're being reckless. And so in response, Jesus told three parables. The first parable was about a man who had a hundred sheep, and and one got lost, so he left the 99 and he went looking for that one. Second story was about a woman who had ten valuable coins, and she mislaid one of them, so she tore the house apart looking for that one lost coin. And then he told the story that we're going to be looking at over the next three weeks. And and each of these stories has two very similar truths in it. The first one's very obvious, and that's that God is obsessed with lost people. He's obsessed with lost people. He'll do anything to rescue the lost. The second one, the second theme is a little bit less clear until you understand the context in which Jesus is teaching it. And, and, And here's how I'd say it. It's that God is obsessed with lost people, and He's angry with those who don't share His passion for them. He's obsessed with lost people, and he's angry when others don't share his same passion. And it's that context, it's that accusation of recklessness that Jesus is addressing when in verse 11 he says this, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. That's some pretty shocking stuff right there. It's shocking on one level in a way that's pretty easy to understand because the the way an inheritance worked in the first century is no different than the way an inheritance works in the 21st century, which is you don't get your inheritance until your parents die, right? You're like, are we allowed to say that in church? You're allowed to say that in church. It's okay. Yeah, you don't get your inheritance until your parents die. So for the son to say, hey, basically give me my share of the estate, he's basically saying, hey, dad, I'm tired of waiting for you to die. I'd like my share of your stuff right now, please. Like, that's a shocking thing to do, is it not? Like, unbelievably insulting. And, and, and our temptation, I think, is to go, well, maybe he's, he's driven by greed or something like that. But the reality is it's a little bit worse than that. The younger son was driven by self-indulgence. The other side was driven by self-indulgence, and self-indulgence is it's the desire to do whatever we want, whenever we want. It's both of those pieces together. See, the money would have been his eventually, and he could have done whatever he wanted with it. But doing whatever he wanted at some point in the future wasn't enough. He wanted to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. He wanted it right then. He didn't want to wait. Self-indulgence is a powerful tendency, and, and I think, honestly, because of our sin nature, we're born with a natural predisposition towards self-indulgence. It looks different in different people. And for instance, sometimes self-indulgence can look like acquiring stuff. It can look like this drive to acquire things, to look and go, I like that. And there's nothing inherently wrong with seeing something and going, I like that. But then that moves to, I love that. And then that moves to, I got to have that, right? Which sounds suspiciously like the sizes at Cold Stone Creamery, right? <laughs> Which, coincidence, I don't know, I'm not saying. You and the Holy Spirit deal with that one. But yeah, it's, I, I like that, and then it's, I love that, and it's, I got to have that, and then it's, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get that, right? I'm going to work ridiculous hours. I'm going to destroy my family so that I can get to that point in my career where I have the money to do the things that I want to do whenever I want to do them. We lie, we steal, we cheat. We, ste- we lie, we cheat, we steal. <laughs> so we can do whatever we want whenever we want. So self notice can look like acquiring stuff. Self-indulgence can also look like acquiring experiences. I think more and more the younger generations have looked at previous generations and gone, yeah, you you got all this stuff, but you're not happy. Your marriage is is a nightmare, and you're miserable, and so stuff doesn't equal satisfaction. So I think, honestly, the millennial generation is a little less inclined towards acquiring stuff, but I see a similar tendency in the millennials, which is to acquire experiences. I'm going to go on that trip, I'm going to go see that thing, I'm going to go to that concert, I'm going to be part of this group, and, and it, it can have the very same effect that we're, we're willing to do destructive things as long as I get a chance to acquire these experiences. Sometimes uh, self-indulgence can look like gaining validation from others. It's, it's, it's doing whatever you have to do to get people to validate you, to, to respect you, or to admire you, or to, to applaud you in some way, and so, you know, whatever you have to do to get Instagram followers, and for a lot of people, that's 
that's their sense that I'm doing okay and I'll do whatever I have to do to do that, right? Or if I, if I get to that point where I have that promotion, I sit in that office, then I'll have the validation that I need. And all of these things can, can be driven by this, this desire to do whatever we want whenever we want it. And that's what's going on for the son, and it's, it's what's going on for a lot of us. And so he does this really shocking thing. Now, what the son does is obviously shocking. Sometimes I think overlooked is the fact that what the father does is possibly even more shocking because the father agrees. His son goes, hey, dad, I'm tired of waiting for you to die. I'd like my share of your stuff right now. And his dad goes, okay. And so he divided his estate between his younger son and his older son. That's, that's crazy. And there's a part of us that would go, that, that's really reckless, Right? I mean, clearly this son doesn't have his priorities straight. Clearly this son is driven by self-indulgence. You're, you're going to fund that? You're going you're to finance that? You're going to allow him to? Why would you allow him to do that? And there's sort of a mystery at that point. And it's interesting to me how similar that question that we ask about the father here is to another question that I get asked as a pastor a lot. Maybe one of the most common questions I get asked, and it kind of goes this way. Hey, if God knew Adam and Eve were going to sin, if God knew all the destruction that would come from Adam and Eve's sin, why did He create them? Why did He put the tree in the garden? Why did He allow them to do what they did, knowing all the stuff that would happen after that? How many of you have ever wondered that question? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a powerful question. And this parable, I believe, answers that question in an incredibly profound way. But not today. In two weeks, we're going to talk about the Father, and we're going to see what the parable has to say in answer to that question. I, I will, I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll tease it for you, okay? Here's what we're going to find out. We're going to find out that only those who have experienced grace can truly know that God is good. Only those who have actually experienced God's grace can truly know that God is good, and that's very important for God's eternal plan. So make sure you're here in two weeks. If you know anybody who's ever asked that question, invite them to come with you two weeks. You're going to see a very profound answer. But for now, let's come back to the younger son, because what we see is the younger son's driven by self-indulgence, and self-indulgence is inevitably destructive. And so we begin to see the destructive nature of this impulse of his. Verse 13 says, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Two things we see that self-indulgence does here. The first is that self-indulgence separates us from those who love us. You notice he, he left. He got his stuff and he, he went away. Now, he could have done his wild living right there, but he chose not to. He went away. And I think what you're seeing there is he had to get away from his family. Partly that was because he knew what he, the way he was going to spend that money, the way he was going to live his life. He didn't want to see his, his father's disappointment. He didn't want to have to deal with his brother's disapproval. He didn't want all that judgment coming, so he needed to get away from them. I think he also probably felt some sense of guilt and shame. Most of us who are driven by self-indulgence, we have some sense that what we're doing isn't right. And so we, we want to get away so that we're not kind of confronted with that reality on a regular basis. So it separated him from his family. He, he had to go away from them. Second thing we see is that self-indulgence leads us to spend rather than invest. Self-indulgence leads us to spend what we have rather than investing in anything that produces a long-term good. Jesus says he squandered it. He, he wasted it. He, he spent it on lavish parties. He stayed in the best hotels. He had Starbucks two or three times a day. All right, that's meddling. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and here's the thing. Understand, there's nothing inherently wrong with parties or with, you know, with hotels or with, with a good cup of coffee. The problem is that the way he's spending his money, it's all on those things that have no lasting impact. They have no return. So he doesn't have real friends. He doesn't have family. He doesn't have a house with equity. He, he doesn't have anything to show for it. He spent it rather than investing it in any way that gives him something that he can trust in the future. And so, verse 14 says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. He didn't have anything to fall back on at this point. He, he didn't have any stuff that he could sell to make money so that he could buy things that he needed. He didn't have any friends. All, all the, the people he'd been hanging out with at the party suddenly turned their backs on him because they weren't real relationships. He didn't have a home to go to or he didn't have anything 
or anybody, really. And see, self-indulgence leaves us with nothing and nobody to depend on. That's inevitably the result. The problem is we don't see it along the way. Along the way, we're like, no, no, these people are my friends. Oh, no, no, you know, this, this is, this is going to lead to good things down the line. And then we get to that place where everything falls apart and we look around and we realize we've got nothing and nobody. And so verse 15 says, He went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. See, finally, self-indulgence leads to humiliation. Self-indulgence leads to humiliation. For this man, the parties have ended, the friends are gone, he's got nothing and nobody, and so he has to go and he becomes a hired hand. He had been almost a prince in his own home. It was clearly a wealthy family. He had position and privilege and prestige, all those things, and now he's a hired hand, and he's been sent into the field to feed the pigs. For a Jewish person, feeding the pigs was the lowest possible job you could even imagine. Pigs were unclean. You couldn't eat them, and you tried to stay away from them. You didn't have anything to do with them, and now he's feeding them. And and to make it worse, to make the humiliation even more profound, as he feeds them, he's looking at the slop that he's giving them, and he's going, I wish I could eat that. I wonder if anybody would notice if I took a handful out of the the pail and I ate it before I threw it into the trough. He's hit rock bottom. He's humiliated. The only good thing about coming to that point in your self-indulgence is that it, it forces you to look up. And so he comes up with a plan. Verse 17 says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'm going to set out. I'll set out, and I will go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And let's just pause for a moment, and let's recognize that this is a great plan. And I'm not being sarcastic. This is a great plan. It has all the elements of a good plan for someone in his situation. It has self-loathing and it has a plan to make it right. It's got both of those things. Both of those things are so important in the first century and they're so important, honestly, for anybody today who finds themselves in a similar kind of place. You gotta have a plan that first off, it expresses that you're, you're disgusted with yourself. You, you loathe yourself. You're so consumed by guilt for your sin, right? He says, I'm gonna go and I'm say, I, I, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Like, it's not just you that I've hurt, Dad. Like, I've gone against God. Like, I've done serious bad stuff. I've really sinned. And then he's going to say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Like, I've lost that honor. What I've done is too terrible. It's beyond that. There's no way that we can fix that. We can't get back to that point. It's too bad. See, this is self-loathing. It's guilt at its finest. And we've been taught That if you want to get back into someone's good graces, if you want somebody to accept you back after you've done things like this, you've got to be disgusted with how bad what you've done is. And and it's got a plan to make it right, too. He's got a plan for restitution. He says, I'm going to go, and and I just I want to work as one of your servants. And I think implied in that is the idea, I'm going to pay it off. I'm going to pay it back. Here's my plan. Here's how I'm going to make it right. It's a good plan. And it's a good plan not only when you're dealing with earthly fathers that have been wronged. It's a pretty good plan in dealing with a heavenly father who's been wronged, right? Like we we naturally think that this is a good plan even when it comes to God. We naturally believe that self-loathing and restitution are necessary if we're going to get right with God. And so we go, if, I, if I'm going to get right with God, I'm going to have to be consumed with guilt over my sin. And I've got to have a plan for making it right. We're going to say, God, I, I'm going to go to church every single Sunday. I'll, I'll, I'll download the podcast and I'll listen to the message twice, right? I'll, I'll, I'll join a life group and, and, and I'll serve and, and I'll give money to the poor and, and I'll do all the right things. I'm going to fix it, God. I'm going to make it right. I feel so bad for everything I've done, but, but here's how I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it up to you. I'm going to do it the way it should be done. I'm going to make it right. And so we naturally assume that self-loathing and, and restitution are, are necessary if we're going to be accepted. 
And so verse 20 says, he got up. Oh, I, I should say this. It, it's a good plan, except that it's not. Right? And there's two problems. Let's just deal with the restitution part first. It's not going to work. This is a rich family. What he has wasted, he's never going to earn back working an hourly wage. He's going to spend his whole life trying, and he's not even going to get close. Spiritually, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. The wrong that we've done, the sin that we've committed, you can't pay that off by, by balancing, oh, but I did these good things. Even if we spent the rest of our lives never doing another bad thing, which is impossible, all the good things don't pay off the debt of sin. See, restitution is beyond our capacity. Besides that, the money is not the problem, right? The money is not the problem here. The problem is that he's rejected a relationship with his father. I mean, let's imagine that he didn't waste it. Let's say he said to you, his dad, hey, I'm tired of waiting for you to die. Give me my share of your stuff now. And then he went, and then he heard about a little stock called Amazon, and he bought Amazon stock, and it went crazy. And now he comes back, and he's like, I have 10 times what I took from you, Dad. Is everything okay? No. Because the problem wasn't the money. The problem was that he rejected his relationship with his father. And no amount of work can revive our relationship. No amount of work can revive our relationship. But it's the best plan he's got, right? So he rehearses it. In verse 20, he says, He got up and he went to his father. Probably as he goes, every step along the way, he's rehearsing, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour on the guilt, I'm going to pour on the self-loathing. And, and I'm not suggesting for a moment he doesn't actually feel it. I, I believe that it's probably deep and it's genuine. He loathes himself at this point. And so he's, he's thinking, there, here's how I'm going to say it, and here's what I'm going to say about how I'm going to make it right. And then we get this word, but. And that might be the most important but in the whole Bible. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. All those are signs of acceptance. All those signs are welcome signs. So the, the, the kid's coming, but while he's a long way off, he probably hasn't even seen his father on the porch yet. While he's still a long way off, his father sees him. Maybe he recognizes something about the walk or something about him. He's like, that's my son, and he runs to welcome. He runs to accept him. Now, we're going to get to the father in a couple weeks, so I don't want to push in too far at this point, but, but we need to acknowledge at least three things here. The first one is this. His father welcomed him without any proof of how guilty his son felt, Right? His father has no idea how guilty his son feels at this point. For all he knows, his son actually could be coming back to ask for more. He has no idea that he actually feels guilty, and yet he welcomed him back. Second, his father welcomed him back without hearing his son's plan to make it right. He has no idea the son's going to say anything about working it off as a servant in the household. He has no idea that there's a plan, and yet he welcomed him back. And then the third one is that his father was willing to humiliate himself even further in order to welcome him back. I say even further because his father's humiliated at this point. In, in that culture, in that community, in that very tight-knit village, everybody knew what had happened. There was no way that they missed it. When his son said, hey, Dad, I'm tired of waiting for you to die, that was being tweeted out immediately, okay? That was on Instagram moments out. Everybody knew what his son had done. And then his father had shocked them all by doing it, and then his son packed up and left, and they had heard rumors. They knew what this kid was doing. They knew about the self-indulgence. His father is humiliated. And his father humiliates himself even further to welcome his son back. He sees his son. He picks up his robes. I don't know if you've ever tried to run in robes. It's not easy. I have a lot of experience, trust me. You've you got to grab a hold of them. You've got to kind of hoist it up, and then you can see your, your ankles and your skinny little legs. And then he, it says he ran. He ran to walk. He didn't, he didn't go. He didn't march out. He ran to welcome him. So he's racing down the street with his robes hiked up. 
And the thing is, in the ancient world, nobody ran except small children and servants. Servants who were told, go do this and do it now. They ran. Nobody else ran. For the respected father of this estate, for, the, for a respected pillar of the community, or at least a once respected pillar of the community, to be racing down the street with his robes hitched up to welcome back this son who had humiliated him so profoundly makes no sense. It makes no sense. But he did. He, he raced down, he threw his arms around him, he kissed him, he said, welcome back. He accepted him home. And, and here's the part that I actually find the most interesting. I tried to put myself in the son's place and I realized, like, I don't know what I would do at that point. I mean, I had a speech prepared. I had a, had a plan laid out. Here's how I'm going to get acceptance. I'm going I'm to pour on the self-loathing, which I actually feel, and I'm going to tell him how I'm going to make it right, and I'm serious about it. I'm going to do that, and that's how I'm going to get my father to accept me. And now my father comes and he accepts me before I lay out the plan. What, what do you do at that point? I think he does what I would do. I, you fall back on the plan because you don't know what else to do. And so verse 21 says, The son said to him, Father, I, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Even though he's already been accepted, he falls back on the plan because he has no idea how else to handle it. He has no idea what to do with his father's welcome, which is what we would call grace. We have no idea what to do with grace. I mean, the Bible says that this is grace, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we had poured on how guilty we felt about our sin. Not when we told God, I'm going to do these things, I'm going to make sure I have this plan in place, and that's how I'm going to earn your acceptance. Then he said, okay, fine. If that's the plan, if you'll stick with it, then I will take care of your sin, then I'll die for you. It's not the way it worked. While we were yet sinners running from him, he died for us. That's grace. And we don't know what to do with it. Like this young man, we have no idea what to do with it. And so grace is so counterintuitive, we often find ourselves falling back on old strategies, Right? Even though we've been accepted by faith, by grace, we often find ourselves going back, but, but God, I, 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 I do, I feel awful, I, I, and I need to, right? I, I, need, I need to feel just so terrible about the sin that I committed in the past and the sin that, that I still have. Grace is so counterintuitive, we fall back on this old strategy time and time again. We might have been saved by grace, but we often find ourselves living by guilt. Because honestly, we, we intuitively believe it has to look like that, right? If we're really going to experience God's acceptance, there's got to be guilt and there's got to be a plan to make it right. Because we don't know what to do with grace. And I love the father's response. His son chokes out the, the plan. He doesn't know what to do with it. He's already been accepted, but he begins to choke out this plan. And I love verse 22. But the father said to his servants, he basically just cuts his son off mid-sentence. He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate for this son of mine who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And so they began to celebrate. I love it. He interrupts his son. His son's got two parts. He's going to pour on the self-loathing and then he's going to tell him the plan. His son manages to choke out part of the self-loathing. He says, like, yeah, yeah, shut up. He interrupts him. He doesn't even let him finish the plan. And, and remember what his son said. He said, I'm not worthy to be called your what? I'm not worthy to be called your son. And what does the father said? He said, for this son of mine, this son of mine. He, he's completely ignoring the son. He's like, yeah, yeah, your plan sucks. I'm sorry, you can't say that in church, I know. Your plan's terrible. It's awful. You're still my son. And I'm just so glad that you turned back. He was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. And, and honestly, you might be in a place right now where you go, honestly, that feels a little premature, doesn't it? It feels like the father is being a little bit reckless. I mean, after all, this son has already demonstrated a tremendous capacity for self-indulgence and, and horrible priorities and poor decision-making, and, and the father is going to lavish more gifts on him without proof of his guilt, without evidence that he's really changed? That's reckless. What's to keep him from, from taking the new gifts and wasting those too? Shouldn't the father make sure that he's changed first? Shouldn't the father 
force the son to demonstrate how guilty he feels? Shouldn't the father wait until he's seen whether or not the change has really taken place before he accepts this kid? Shouldn't he? Apparently not. And remember, Jesus is teaching this to a group of people who are going, hey, Jesus, you're being reckless. You're, you're, you're eating with these people. You're accepting all these people before they've proven to you that they've really changed. You, you need them to work for your acceptance. And Jesus seems to be saying, no, I want them to work from my acceptance. Not work for my acceptance by changing. I want to accept them, and I want my acceptance to become the foundation. I want grace to become the, 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 the solid ground from which real transformation happens and it lasts for eternity. So no, I, I, I'm not going to wait. And, and really, the heartbeat of this so clear. It's, it's counterintuitive. It's hard for us to grasp. It's so different from the world that we live in, and honestly, the way that we have experienced other people in our lives, and honestly, probably the way that we've shown other people the way they need to respond. But the, but the message is very simple. It's this. God is on the front porch waiting for the first sign that you're ready to come home. God is on the front porch waiting. He's waiting on the front porch for the first sign that you're ready to come home. And the first time there's a sign, he's going to come to you. And he's going to accept you. And his acceptance of you will be the foundation of lasting change, not the requirement for it. So Jesus says, you think I'm being reckless? You don't understand grace. And, and honestly, we don't, Right? There's a big part of me that looks at what the Father did in this parable. I'm like, that, I don't think that's wise. I don't think he's done enough. And, and here's the thing, and if you're feeling that same way, I'm telling you, I feel that same way. What we need to recognize is that we have a lot of the older brother in us. We'll get to him next week. But for now, understand that God's waiting on the porch for the first sign that we're ready to come home. Three questions. Question number one, how much of myself do I see in the younger brother? How much of this tendency to self-indulgence do you see? I think we all have it. We dress it up, we call it other things, but we all have it. Some of you, you're going, I, I am the younger brother. <laughs> That's how I've been living my life. We've got to call it what it is. Second question is, do I believe that the depth of my guilt is the key to being accepted by God? Do I believe that the depth of my guilt is the key for God's acceptance, for His love, for His grace? Because that's a lie. It's a lie from hell. But it's a lie that it's, it's deep in our souls. And so some of you right now, you're going, yeah, I'm the younger brother, and I, I believe that, and that's why I haven't come to Jesus. That's why I've never given my life to Him, because I, I don't know that I have enough guilt yet. I don't know that I've, I've got a plan for making it right. I don't know that I've made enough progress. I, I don't, I, honestly, I don't even know that I feel that bad about my sin yet. And honestly, maybe you're here today going, I want to want to feel that bad. Honestly, I don't feel that bad, but I know I should, so I, I wish I felt as bad as I know that I ought to, but, but I don't. It's, it's just I, I kind of want to want to feel that bad because you believe that that's the key to your acceptance. And I want to tell you, that's enough. That's plenty. Recognizing sin for what it is is, is all that's really necessary. The question is, can you, can you get rid of this idea that the depth of your guilt is not the key to your acceptance by God so that you can actually start to turn around and look back to the porch? Maybe as followers of Jesus, you're continuing to struggle with this. You've given your life to Jesus, but you're continuing to say, if God's going to really love me today, if I'm really going to experience God's blessing, I have to feel awful about all the things that I've done and the things that I continue to do and the sins I continue to struggle with. Do you really believe that your guilt is the key to his acceptance? Because Jesus says you're wrong. 
And third question, am I living for my Father's acceptance or from it? Am I living for my Father's acceptance or am I living from it? Do I think that transformation is the key for Him accepting me? I got to do these things, I got to pile on all this stuff so that God will love me or do I recognize the truth which is that God is a father waiting on the porch for the first sign that we're ready to turn back, and then he races to us. He embraces us. He loves us. He, he drenches us in grace. And it is from that place of acceptance that transformation really begins to happen. Are you living for your father's acceptance or from it? Would you pray with me? Lord, at all of our campuses, as followers of Jesus, we, we come to you today and, and we say thank you. Thank you for loving us in spite of our sin. Thank you for loving us even when we didn't have as much guilt as we feel like we should have. Thank you for saving us even when we were sinners and even when we had no plan for making it right because honestly, there's no way to make it right. But you made it right for us. You sent your son. He died on the cross. He forgave our sin. And that simply by trusting in him, we were forgiven. We were forgiven and we were set free, and we were brought into your family, and we returned to a relationship with our Father. Lord, would you break all the lies that keep us from embracing this reality and allow us to live from grace? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask everybody to continue an attitude of prayer, because I believe right now at all of our campuses and, and in church online, there are people listening who are going, you know what? I see a lot of myself in the younger brother because I am the younger brother. That's where I am. And right now, it may be that you're, you're hearing and, and it's connecting for the first time that your guilt is not the key to being accepted by God, that your plan to make it right is, is completely useless because it can't be done and it's not necessary. And if that's you and, you, and it's connecting for the first time and you're going, I, I'm ready to turn back, I'm ready to look back to the porch, I'm ready to be accepted by my Father, that's... That's incredibly good news because the reality is that your father loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his own son to die for you. He took your sins upon himself and he paid the price so that you wouldn't have to. And then simply by giving your life to Jesus, by putting your faith in Jesus, you will be accepted, you will be forgiven, and you will be brought into a relationship with God for all of eternity. And if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, if you're ready to turn back to your father sitting on the porch right now, would you, would you just slip your hand up? That's fantastic. That's awesome. If you're watching online, just click the button right below me. If you're watching on Facebook, type in the comment section, I'm ready to turn back. And then wherever you are right now, if you will just say this to God in your heart. God, I've done wrong, and I am sorry. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. Jesus, thank you for rising from the dead to show me that you have new life to offer. I need that new life. I need that forgiveness. I need my Father's acceptance. So Jesus, I give you my life, and I receive forgiveness and new life and my God's acceptance back. Jesus, I'm yours from now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just celebrate those who turned back today? It's fantastic.